that is what income inequality looks like. It looks like you increasingly reliant on government to, to, to pay for basic goods and services to the point now where the average middle class person is uh, not a net, uh, a net payer into the system. They're actually taking money out. But the reality is they're only taking out what was stolen from them. The wealth of their currency was stolen from them. And so the, you know, the, the, the cronies have no problem handing them crumbs from the bread they stole from them and saying, hey, if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be getting these crumbs. No, if it wasn't for me, my money wouldn't have lost 98% of its value. I've been talking with Black Lives Matter uh, activists about the Fed and how we wouldn't have a police to prison uh, industrial com uh, uh, a police in prison industrial complex and a military industrial complex and out of control, un increasingly unaccountable militarized police forces and uh and, and these the endless uh uh, uh increasing in, in prison rates and 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 the the school to prison pipeline we wouldn't have any of these things if the government couldn't just print out endless reams of money and, and give it to whoever they want to i'm the anime trainer and today we are going to be talking with vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party, Spike Cohen. Um, I'm really, really excited that he decided to come and talk to us uh, because uh, I'm I'm actually nerding out just a little bit. Um, but yeah, uh, if you just want to go ahead and introduce yourself really quick, Spike, uh, for our viewers, just so they know a little bit more about you. Yeah, absolutely. And just out of curiosity, uh, is this in mirror, in mirror reverse the way you're seeing it or just for me? Uh, uh, we're seeing it um, correctly. Okay, good, good, good. So, yeah. Hey, everybody. My name is Spike Cohen. I am the vice presidential candidate uh, for the Libertarian Party, along with my presidential running mate, Dr. Joe Jorgensen. We are running on a platform of setting America free, taking the power out of the hands of the Republicans and Democrats and their billionaire cronies that have bought and paid for them to be in office and putting the power and the money and the decision making and freedoms back in your hands where it always belongs so that you can live and thrive and prosper in ways that the uh, Republicans would never want you to. And uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm running on that, and I'm I'm happy to be on this show. I will admit that when I uh, that I'm, I'm not heard of the show, and when I saw the title, I thought I'm not sure what I'm in for, but I bet I'll enjoy it. <laughs> All right. Um, so I call you Spike. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> Sorry, Spike. Uh, just for the benefit of our uh, of our listeners, what is libertarianism? So the I guess the elevator pitch of libertarianism is that we believe that you own yourself. And because you own yourself, that means you own your your life and your body. You can do whatever you want with your body and, and you can do what you want with your life. Uh, and since you own your body, you own your labor, you can do what you want with your with your to, to do labor. No one should be able to make you uh, do something that you don't want to do. Uh, and since you own your labor, you own the product of your labor, which is your property. We believe that all of these things, your life, your body, your property and so forth, they belong to you. You have the exclusive right of enjoyment uh, of these things. You can give them away. You can sell them. You can rent them. You can share them. You can do whatever you want with them because they're yours. They belong to you. And we believe that anytime that anyone tries to take from someone else, that it's an act of aggression. And we believe aggression is not only bad from a moral standpoint, that you shouldn't take from people, you shouldn't harm them, you shouldn't try to tell them what to do or and so forth. But it also doesn't work from a utilitarian standpoint. It doesn't work either. If I can take from the two of you and anyone else that's watching or listening to this whenever I see fit, I'm not going to be a good steward of what I have because I can just take more from you whenever I see fit. And y'all aren't necessarily going to be the best stewards of what you have because you know I can come and take it from you at any time. And libertarians recognize that the bad, centrally planned, arbitrarily defined and crony friendly policies that have been uh, uh, put in place by the Republicans and Democrats and their exclusive control of every lever of power of government for over 160 years is really just a system they've created whereby they presume the authority to take from you and aggress upon you whenever they see fit. And we recognize that the reason that we have the often harmful and abusive and inequitable outcomes that come from these policies that we've come to know and love from the Republican parties is because precisely because they are policies and systems of aggression. All oppression and infringements and tyranny are at their core an act of aggression. And we as libertarians recognize that the best way for us to live fairer and safer and healthier and happier and freer lives is to take that power back, to take the power away and to take the wealth away and to take the freedom away from those politicians and those cronies, the billionaire cronies that have bought and paid for them to be in office and give it back to the people where it always belonged. Cool. Amen. 
<laughs> That's why I call it Power God and Anime. So I can say Amen, and now it kind of fits the branding. We can keep going now. All right, we're good now. <laughs> Um, I say power, power, you say amen, and it holds. It fits into the. There we go. Um, uh, I, I think Stephen and I kind of agree with this. We think I, I think libertarianism is actually the most um, uh, worth. It's the closest thing that we can do that would even be like for for religious people, for for God fearing people. Libertarianism just makes sense because otherwise you're giving that kind of authority that probably shouldn't be in the hands of man man to uh, to men. <laughs> Uh, and yep. they've not earned that. If you've if you've got the, an, a, a government that has the ability to to do, you know, something that you like, but other people don't like, whenever that government switches hands, all of a sudden, now they can do maybe something you don't. <laughs> and it's like you. That's- it's not about who's in power. It's about that somebody has that much power to begin with. The difference between and there's a, and there's a biblical as- aspect to this as well. Uh, the difference between uh, we often get caught up in the differences between left and right. But from a libertarian standpoint, if someone wants to, I, I consider myself a capitalist. So absent coercion, absent the the coercion of of central planning and, and a centralized government, and simply allowing people to operate how they wish. If I and others like me want to live in a voluntary, propertarian society that's based on property rights and mores and, and, and respects that and, and interacts with each other based on that, and other people over here want to voluntarily interact in a more collectivized way where everything is in common ownership and we respect each other's rights to operate uh, 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 absent coercion against each other, me saying, I don't think your idea is good, so you have to live my way, or them saying, I don't think your idea is good, so you have to live my way, we can live in harmony we can live in peace we can interact with each other we can trade we can be friends we can do whatever we want we may find that there are parts of their system and parts of our system that work or don't work and we may end up creating something that's even better than anything we even envision but when you add the coercion now the difference between just a libertarian capitalist and a libertarian socialist living in harmony now with coercion where one side has to win over the other and try to use coercion to force it that's how you end up with a cold war between capitalists and socialists where nuclear weapons are pointed at each other and everyone's trying to use espionage and and you know destabilizing of smaller countries and so forth and using the world as a as basically one large cynical deadly chess game in order to see whose system wins not because one not because one wins in the, in the marketplace of ideas, but through force and coercion. That is the difference between an authoritarian society and a libertarian one, is that we allow the idea that we can interact differently. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the Bible. I, I'm Jewish, and, and in, you know, I guess what Christians would call the Old Testament or what we'd call Tanakh, uh, there's the story of where the, the, the Israelites went to God, the, the Hebrews went to God and said, uh, we want a king, we demand a king, we want to be ruled over like the other countries have. We want to have the great kings, the powerful kings like the other nations have. We want to be envied by our powerful king by the other nations. And God said, (laughs) yeah, are are you you positive of this? I've given you a council of rabbis. They're telling you how to do things based on, uh, you know, basically on on, on my laws for how you should live. Uh, And you can choose to live that way or suffer the consequences of of, of not living that way, usually in the afterlife, but sometimes immediately as a result of, of, of doing things in bad ways. Uh, you can choose how, outside of those religious questions, you can largely live the way you want. I'm not going to say it was a libertarian society, but it certainly wasn't as authoritarian as we've come to know now. And, uh, and you know, you can pretty much do whatever you want outside of that. Are you sure that you want a king? I, I think you're going to be unhappy if you go with this and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah no, we definitely want a king. Uh, we want to be ruled over. Uh, we, we see, we're jealous of these other kings that we see. We want people to be jealous of our king. Yes. And so then he goes, okay, here's all the things that's going to happen as a result of you wanting to be ruled over by other human beings. And he lists out all of the terrible things that are about to happen in all of the chapters after that one in the Bible, right? And they go, okay, granted, but we still want a king. He goes, all right, fine, I'll give you a king, right? And so even when, we, when we're told these stories in, in, in the Bible, and I'm sure it's, it's similar with Christians as well, we're told these stories in the Bible, we go, King David, and he slew Goliath, and, and it's like, yeah. But if you'll recall, earlier on, God was saying, you shouldn't even be doing any of this. This is a bad idea. This is a uniquely bad idea. I will go ahead and give it to you because you get the government you want. And now look. And basically the entire rest of the Old Testament and even going into the New Testament is a series of stories about how the the, uh, the Hebrews 
pretty imme immediately regretted their choice and had to live with it because that's what they wanted. And, uh, you know, to, and leading ultimately to the disbanding of their of their kingdom and their nation as a result of that. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's right there. You know, you were told you, you didn't need humans to rule over you and you insisted and then you got what you asked for. You brought exactly. King David as a great King David. And yeah, God even said, this is, a, this is a man after my own heart. But what did King David yep. do the second he saw a beautiful woman? He slept with her, had her husband killed on the front lines. Killed, and off the war, and, yeah. the, and then God has to send someone over, was it Nathan, right? Nathan has to send Nathan yep. over and be like, okay, so here's what's going to happen now. You can't, even the best leaders are still prone to just use their power for their own benefit or for their own vices or anything. It doesn't matter who it is. And if you're exactly, if your system relies on the people operating it to be saint like in a way that has never existed, at least among mortal human beings, then that's a that's a that's a that's an obvious flaw to your system. If it requires everyone to be uniquely good at all times, because even if you find a bunch of people who it, right now are going to all be uniquely good in a way that no human being ever has been, at some point, assuming they're not immortal, they will die, or they will retire, or they'll be replaced in some other way, and you will need people to be good in perpetuity in order for that system to work. And for that matter, if that system works, then so does state communism, and so does every other form of government. If everyone involved in that system is a uniquely good pe person, then you could have any kind of government. Uh, you could have no government. You could have whatever you wanted. You could have whatever system you wanted because we're all perfect people. Because we are not, and because we have obvious uh, uh, inequities and, and things like, you know, a, a, a profit motive and, and greed or enlightened self, uh, self, uh, 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 enlightened self-interest or whatever else, it makes sense to have a system that recognizes that people will often become corrupt and that therefore power should be decentralized so that when someone comes becomes corrupt a the level of harm that they can inflict is not as bad and b it's easier to stop them no awesome. yeah i agree with that um go ahead i, I feel like we should i think we have a question that would uh you have a question that would slide right into that pretty easily actually yeah okay so uh congress is well, and the government in general, but Congress in particular is full of corruption based on, uh, you know, people basically buying politicians right, right. Uh, through this and whatnot. <laughs> and, and, and what kind of are you guys thinking about uh, to base to try to eliminate that corruption in Congress? So the biggest thing we can do from the executive level uh, you know, a lot of this stuff, for example, a term limits would be a very powerful thing, but that's something that has to happen from Congress. It actually requires a constitutional amendment. So that's not, we can lobby for it and we can say, hey, best way to get term limits is to vote for a bunch of libertarians. And, and so we can push the needle towards term limits and get that passed. In terms of what the executive branch can do, and at the risk of sounding like a stereotypical libertarian, is we can end the Fed. And here is why, because a lot of people... If you are around libertarians, but maybe aren't one yourself, and you've heard end the Fed over and over ad nauseum, and you think, surely they are over-exaggerating all the things that would be fixed if we ended the Fed. And yet, not really. If anything, there are a lot of times that we don't bother explaining how the Fed also makes a given situation worse. Uh, so for those who don't know what the Fed is... Uh, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913 as essentially a privately owned central bank that would decide how much or how little money would be printed. How many, uh, if, and if you look at any dollar bills you have, they say Federal Reserve note. They are actually printed by the Federal Reserve. Uh, or they have the, the printing is done by the US Treasury, but it's the actual Federal Reserve who decides how much gets printed out. And two things happened in 1913 with the Federal Reserve and the income uh, tax that also had to be implemented in order to justify the value of Federal Reserve notes, because that's why taxation exists. That's a whole other subject. Uh, so when the, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, two things happened immediately afterwards. The first thing that happened was a year later, we went to war and we have been at war ever since. And the second thing that happened, actually three things happened. The second thing that happened is that we've had a series of boom and bust cycles that are based almost entirely on how much or how little money is being printed out by the Federal Reserve. And then the third thing that happened is that the cost of living 
has continuously gone up anywhere from 3% to 15% at times every single year, which prior to the implementation of the Federal Reserve was not the case. The cost of living went up and down based on supply and demand and the general economy. If the economy went up, the cost of living went up. Economy went down, the cost of living went down. Instead now, whether it goes up or goes down, is you know soaring to new highs or screeching to an absolute halt and, and destroying people's lives in the process, the cost of living continues to go up. Now you're probably wondering, how can we prove that's not just a coincidence that we always are at war and we have boom and bust cycles and that we have inflation? Well, the reason we have inflation is because by printing out endless Federal Reserve notes without any increase in corresponding value, just simply inflating the overall money supply, you are devaluing the value of each one of those Federal Reserve notes that we have in our wallets and our bank accounts and that we use to buy and rent things that we need every day. It is why the cost of living continues to go up no matter what the economy is doing because the value of the currency is going down because they're printing out endless Federal Reserve notes. The Federal Reserve note today, the dollar bill that you have in your wallet, is worth two cents on the dollar what it was worth in 1913. Imagine if your money was worth 50 times more than it is now. Imagine if when you made $7 an hour, you were actually making $350 an hour. That's how much they've robbed you. And now it makes sense that the gap between those who have and those who haven't continues to widen. It makes sense that income inequality is continuing to go through the roof because they're robbing you without you even seeing it. They're robbing you in terms of the value of the money that they force you to use. Now, next question, why are we at war? Why, why, what does that have to do with war? The American people would have never agreed to be taxed at the rates required to finance endless war that does not benefit us and actually harms us and to the benefit of incredibly powerful uh, billionaire contractors and foreign dictators. We would have never agreed to be taxed for that. But if the Federal Reserve simply prints out endless Federal Reserve notes and lends it to the federal government to pay not just for uh, the wars, but also the war on drugs and uh, an increasingly militarized and unaccountable police state and a myriad of other things that we never would have even wanted, much less agreed to be taxed to directly to pay for, they can pay for it without having to tax us. Well, they do tax us, but they tax us with interest because what happens is the Federal Reserve lends that money to itself, to the federal government, uh, in the form of buying treasury bonds. And every time they do that, they're buying a 40-year treasury bond. Every single day, they take out another series of 40-year loans that you and your children and their children and maybe even their children have to pay off with interest. What a cynical and uh, and, and devious way to rob the American people. That is what the Federal Reserve is. And now back to your original question, because I did remember it. How does What does this have to do with corruption? When the best way to make money in a given market is to buy off politicians because they can hand you endless money without having to tax anyone for it, that becomes the best way to make money. Once you reach a certain point, once you're now, you're already a multimillionaire, you're already a billionaire, and you have those connections in, in, uh, in, in people in power and politics and, and the politicians that are sitting in office, now it doesn't make sense to make money by providing value to the market, by innovating and, and competing and making new solutions. You can do that too, but that's not the easy money. The easy money is spending a few million bucks or even a couple billion dollars to put your favorite people in office and make endless reams of billions of Federal Reserve notes that they print out especially for you. And, to, and not to mention that, but also having to create uh, endless new regulations and, 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 and legislation that benefits you at the direct uh, expense of anyone who might try to compete with you. That's how you become rich. That's Once you become wealthy, that's how you stay wealthy or become ultra wealthy much more easily than the way that you should do it, which is by providing value to the market. You're providing value to a much smaller market of politicians who can hand you money at the federal trough. So the way that you end the corruption, or at least greatly scale it back, is you end the Fed so that if the government wants to uh, to pay for something, they either have to, they have to tax you directly to pay for it which now they have to actually explain to you why you need to be taxed, which is a lot harder than telling you that, well, we got to raise your taxes because all that interest is really piling up and we can't afford to pay it anymore. They have to actually tell you what they're paying for, which is a lot harder. 
And then the other thing that we do is we simply just scale back the size and scope and power and cost of the government to begin with, because the less things that the government has control of, the less able they are to use their uh, power in a corrupt way to benefit the cronies that bought and paid for them to be in office. So the short answer is you, and I don't have a lot of short answers, the short <laughs> answer is you end the Fed and you end the, 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 the massive centralization of power in the federal government. Okay. Do you feel like the the ending of the Fed and the you know that obviously having a ripple effect out throughout uh, throughout Congress and the all that stuff? Uh, do you feel like that would have an effect on um, vis a vis what you were talking about with the uh, people being ultra ultra rich and they they get that way in order by you know doing the things that they're bu you know buying politicians. Uh, do you feel like that will have an effect on uh, income inequality people talk about? Oh, it'll have a major effect on it for two reasons. Number one, there will still be billionaires. There will still be multimillionaires. I'm not saying there's not going to be any disparity of outcome. There simply will be. In any system that allows people to to uh, you know thrive or, or, or fail on their own merits, and just the fact that even in that system, there are going to be unfair things that happen and, and, and you know unearned advantages and things like that, there's, there's always going to be some income inequality. But what we have is, is a, a largely a two-prong attack on income equality. One of those prongs is people that are able to become uber billionaires without providing any value just by you know getting that money at the top from the federal trough and then the other aspect of it is the people at the bottom whose value and wealth continues to go down because their their wage increases or their their increase in their value of what they can actually trade for their labor isn't growing as fast as the cost of living because of that endless printing of federal federal reserve notes so it's actually driving them down like i said imagine if your money was worth 50 times what it is now because in 1913 your money was worth 50 times what it is now that is income inequality Imagine if you were making like seven figures a year, that is income inequality. And now you may say to yourself, well, yeah, but I live a better quality of life than someone did a hundred and some odd years ago. Yeah, because of technology. But in terms of your position in the overall economy of the United States, it has reduced that much in that time. That is what income inequality looks like. It looks like you increasingly reliant on government to, to, to pay for basic goods and services to the point now where the average middle class person is uh, not a net, uh, a net payer into the system. They're actually taking money out. But the reality is they're only taking out what was stolen from them. The wealth of their currency was stolen from them. And so the, you know, the, the, the cronies have no problem handing them crumbs from the bread they stole from them and saying, hey, if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be getting these crumbs. No, if it wasn't for me, my money wouldn't have lost 98% of its value. So that is where we stand right now. And that is federal uh, ending the Fed uh, fixes a myriad of things. Again, I am the consummate libertarian in saying that ending the Fed fixes most of the world's ills uh, or many of their ills. But one of them is absolutely income inequality. What's that? I said, I appreciate you at least talking about it in a way that explains it rather than just being, you know, and the Fed, and the Fed. And the Fed. Yeah, no, actually explaining yeah. why it is. Because if I say you end the Fed, people go, you know what the average question is? What's the Fed? <laughs> and then we go, no. what do you mean, what's the Fed? The Fed is the Fed! Instead of actually answering the question, well, that's an excellent question. What's the yeah. Fed? I'll tell you what the Fed is, and here's why it's terrible, and here's why it needs to go. I've been talking with Black Lives Matter uh, activists about the Fed and how we wouldn't have a police to prison uh, industrial com uh, uh, a police in prison industrial complex and a military industrial complex and out of control, un increasingly unaccountable militarized police forces and uh, and, and these the endless uh, 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 increasing in, in prison rates and 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 the the school to prison pipeline. We wouldn't have any of these things if the government couldn't just print out endless reams of money and and give it to whoever they want to. So it sounds like you're saying America's main problem is caused by a giant splinter in the leg and all the politicians want to buy the most expensive band-aids to put over it without removing the splinter that's a fair uh, analogy yeah i mean our, our I mean, problems it sounds are created like, go ahead it sounds like all these problems would just be solved it doesn't require you know a six trillion dollar spending package or no, gosh, no. or anything just just get rid of this and let's see what happens yeah and it's not you know to be clear it's not like oh we end the fed and everything becomes wonderful the Fed is emblematic of a myriad of problems that would also have to be ended necessarily as a result of that. If you end the Fed, you have to end the wars because we won't be able to afford them.
And that's good. We shouldn't have ever tried to afford them. Um, but it also means if you end the Fed, you have to end the war on drugs because we're not going to have the money for that. Uh, and that, again, that's good. These are all good things. So ending the Fed and ending these other things that are built around it and and which it is built around uh, because it is a holistic thing. You know, people will say, what are your top three issues? And I'm like, uh, government, its abuses and its excesses. Like, I mean, it's, it, it, you know, you can't really like narrow it down to three main things because they all feed into each other the problems with education feed into the problems with the criminal justice system the problems with the criminal justice system feed into the problems with drug policy the problems with drug policy feed into uh social and domestic problems that are being uh, uh created largely by this fake uh theatrics between the republicans and democrats that is fed into by the fact that they are a a, a system of corruption that is built around throwing endless federal reserve notes at all of their favored cronies to, to make them wealthy at our expense all all of these things are built around each other. And so you look at the core issues, you follow the money, as it were, and you follow the core cause of these things. And what you find is it is really just a system of centralized power uh, that has no other use but protecting the power and influence and market share of some incredible, a relative handful of incredibly cynical and and and, and I, I would say sociopathic politically connected uh, very powerful like billionaires and multimillionaires who have a vested interest in keeping the rest of us down because they built a system that enriches them at our expense. Nice. All right, let's talk about healthcare for a second. Okay. <laughs> um, sounds to me like the, pro- the, the solution, if, if, if the money was worth three times what it is now, sounds like healthcare wouldn't even be an issue. Uh, but the cost of healthcare, rising problem in the U.S. We've witnessed attempts by the feds to bring those costs down. I mean, we all remember when Obamacare was uh, happened in 2010. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Trump, I just read this yesterday, Trump is seeking to force insurance providers to cover pre-existing conditions, just like Obamacare did. Mm-hmm. And when that happened, all that happened with the premiums went up, and I still right. couldn't afford health care, and then I had to buy it, blah, blah, blah. Yep. What kind of solution, besides ending the Fed, <laughs> for this problem could we expect from uh, Jor- a Jorgensen Cohen administration. So you just reached peak libertarianism where you instantly made the connection that if we were each making like 300 and something bucks an hour or the equivalent of that in purchasing power, that we wouldn't even be talking about this. But while we're here, uh, let's talk about healthcare. So recent studies have shown that anything from seven, somewhere between 75, uh, anywhere, depending on who you ask, anywhere between 70 and 80% of the cost of healthcare is just the cost of complying with various red tape, regulations, uh, mandates, taxes, and, and various other costs, regulatory uh, 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 costs of, of, of basically of demonstrating uh, uh, that you are complying, compliance costs with regulations related to Medicare, Medicaid, and government mandated insurance. Now, let me be clear. I am not talking about the cost of providing Medicare or Medicaid or subsidized insurance benefits. I am talking about the cost of of complying with various regulatory burdens, which largely do nothing to help the public safety or the public health. They are entirely driven to just create endless red tape so we can have more bureaucrats that are employed by federal and state governments. And it makes sense that that's... What's that? (laughs) I said, but we have administrative jobs. Well, yeah, thank, <laughs> thankfully we have a, jo- a a robust jobs program, uh, if nothing else. But so here, but here's the thing, and this makes sense, right? You go into a hospital. Anyone who's been to a hospital recently, or been to a doctor's office or a medical center or whatever, what do you see? You see a doctor, you see one or two nurses, and you see like 15 administrators, right? You got one person, one or two people who just check you in, and then you have one person who asks you this question. You've got one person who checks your insurance, especially in the hospitals. It's the worst. You have one person that asks you this. You have one person that asks you that. You have people that they have one job, and the reason they have one job is because they're actually required to just have that job because that is difficult enough in the in the scale of complying with stuff. So. And, and what has happened as a result of that is that the cost, I mean, again, we're talking somewhere anywhere, anywhere between 70 and 80% of the cost just in that. That's before you get into, for example, patent protections on very, very old drugs like insulin and epinephrine, drugs that have been around longer than most of us have been alive, which cost pennies to make and which sell for pennies in most other countries. An EpiPen? Sells for a few bucks in most other countries. Here, some people pay thousands of dollars for them. And there's no reason for it. Actually, there is a reason for it. The federal government says, you have a patent protection. And only you 
and you and you get to make them because you have the patent protections you applied for them oh and you help get me into office so you you and you and you are the only ones who get to make it and those three because they don't have a lot of competition say okay we'll make it for over here you make it for over there and you make it for over there and we won't even compete with each other and now we can charge whatever we want for that epinephrine and that and and that insulin we can jack up the price a thousand or ten thousand times uh what, what we would pay anywhere charge anywhere else and just to make sure that americans have to pay it we'll make it illegal for you to go to other countries and buy it there and bring it back i actually really <sighs> like the fact that you talked about this because this was a follow-up question i had yep. related Oh, so I'm, I'm it's I'm, part and parcel right. of it. If you break down what you know, where if you break down all the costs related to healthcare, and you and you look at which one's growing and you know what, at what rates they're go, growing, they're all growing. But the cost of uh, it's like a straight vertical line in terms of the, the rate of growth. It's absurd, and it's entirely because of patent protections. And just and, and and usually at some point price equilibrium would would kick in because at some point there would just be too many people who simply could not you know spend thousands of dollars a month for, 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 you know, insulin or epinephrine. But if the government's underwriting it and paying for it, spending endless federal reserve notes uh, to pay for it and tax dollars to pay for it, there is no such equilibrium. They can charge whatever they want. If the insurance companies are mandated to pay for it, they can charge whatever they want. And if you are one of those poor souls who doesn't have insurance, you just have to die if you need it. That is our healthcare system. And it is, let's be clear, it is not a free market system. In a free market, we would never say that a handful of companies uh, can, can be the only ones to make a drug that has been around forever, cost pennies to make. There, there's no, there is no interest in protecting uh, uh, that intellectual property. In a free market, we wouldn't be telling providers that they would need to spend three, three or four times, their, you know, like 70 to 80% of their costs uh, are related entirely to just complying with various edicts and diktat. That, that, that would not happen in a free market. In a free market, if the doctor is charging this much amount for their services, and that keeps their, you know, that keeps people coming in and they get enough uh, people where they can make money, but they know if they charge this much, they'll start losing customers because they can't afford it. It's called price equilibrium. Your price stays down, not just because you have competitors that are also, you know, competing with you for who can provide the best value, but just by the virtue, the, the, the virtue and the fact that if too many people can't afford it, even if you're making more money per patient, you're not making as much money as you would make to bring it down to a level that still allows you to make money, but also they can afford it. But with a government subsidized system, there is no price equilibrium. Same thing with higher education, same, same, same issue there. Um, and so this is what has happened. The way that we fix this is absolutely not to put the same organization that created a system that does not care if you die in charge of deciding whether you get health care or not. They call it Medicare for all. It is not Medicare for all. Medicare is an 80-20 system. They pay 80, you pay 20. It requires you to have private insurance. It is not, we're, they are not proposing Medicare for all. They are proposing the VA for all. And if you know anyone on the VA, I encourage you to talk to them and ask them what that system is like. Which, by the way, we're getting rid of the VA, too. We're going to just give the money directly to the veterans and let them get the health care they need, which not only will give them much better health outcomes, but it'll also save the American taxpayer billions of dollars a year because this might shock you, but the government sucks so much at money managing something that the VA, which is a terrible organization in terms of the, the health outcomes, still costs more per patient than simply handing them the money and letting them go and buy their own health insurance in the private market. So we will both help the taxpayers and the poor people that have been subjected to that system as well. And the providers in the VA who are so frustrated that they can't actually do their job because of all of that government red tape. Now they can get jobs as doctors in the private market where they will be in a, in a, in a, in a, in, in a much more unregulated private market uh, and market-based market, which will allow them to actually provide value to their client, to their their patients, instead of watching their patients be murdered by red tape. That's awesome. Yeah, my brother's a disabled veteran. And you know, so. he can he can tell us more. He can tell us far better than I can how bad that system is. Um. So, kind of going into what you were just talking about, 
Um, a lot of people, when they talk about healthcare, they talk about all this stuff, and they talk about the um, the issues with the insulin or the epinephrine, you know, the, the stuff like that. They they get really upset at oh, this is just late stage <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> it's, it's like oh, this is you want the free market produce this, and I'm like, no, you like you like you said, you really don't understand. This is not yeah. what's mm-hmm. happening. The things that you're upset about are because of government intervention yeah absolutely and the way that and this is sort of just a rule of thumb in general when i talk to people who don't get it i recognize that they still understand the problem and they still have valid concerns and so what i typically do is i empathize with them and say yeah this system is terrible look at how these these incredibly cynical powerful wealthy people just jack up the price of a life-saving medication it is something that that rely that some people you know millions of americans rely on these things or they will die and so what do they do? They jack up the price and become billionaires on it, way past any reasonable profit, just to a point where an increasing number of Americans can't even afford it, and they don't care because they're still making so much money. They're making more money for patients per patient because they can jack it up so much. And if someone dies as a result, eh, they shouldn't have been so poor. Okay. And so you empathize with them on that, and then you say, and why is it like that? And they'll go, yeah, yeah, because of greed and because of right. And I'll go, yeah, but why, why can't I make that insulin like it's it, it, like the chemical compound for insulin is not a secret anyone who has the wherewithal to make a drug could make insulin uh anyone who has the wherewithal to make uh epinephrine could do so and anyone who has basic understanding of making a machine could make an epi pen there's nothing magical there what's stopping people from making it well it's got patent protections right but who's enforcing that and who do you want to put in charge of healthcare? That's a way to have that conversation. Back to it. Yeah, that that's a way to have that conversation. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to jump ahead since we are um, going through time here. Uh, I know, Spike, a lot of minds are currently occupied with one of two issues, maybe both. Uh, coronavirus mm-hmm. and or the Black Lives Matter police brutality issue yep. thing that's been going on since uh, what happened to George Floyd. Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually made a video about the police brutality issue here on the channel, actually. We spoke about Joe in that video. Viewers can check that out after the interview. Uh, but what strikes me as an even more pressing issue mm-hmm. is the pedophilia problem. All right, we we had Jeffrey Epstein. He had him, his jet, his private island, we, his fight logs. We had young girls talking about what happened to them. Yeah. Uh, we had the sicko nailed. And the next thing we know, he's dead. And the media doesn't want to doesn't seem to want to cover this at all. And in fact, because they didn't cover it, I think I don't think anyone would even remember that guy's name had it not been for the meme Epstein, Epstein didn't, didn't kill himself. Kill himself yeah. So the memers saved the day there. Now now we've got this Maxwell chick uh, whose last name I can't pronounce. Uh, we've got testimonies from young girls pointing the finger at politicians like Bill Clinton and others. Mm-hmm. Uh, things are looking up for the case again. New leads, new testimonies, and a federal judge was assigned a case in, in very Al Capone like style because like signed a case about bank fraud with Epstein. Yep. This could be like a Capone all over again. I like, caught him with tax fraud, caught Epstein with this, whatever. Mm-hmm. Maybe exposed tons of pedophiles in the biggest sex trafficking ring of the modern era. And then there was an assassination, like something straight out of The Godfather. This Someone comes by, uh, intimidates the judge by committing an assassination in their own house. Yep. Days later, we find that guy killed. And no one's talking about yep. this. So my question for you, I, bring all that, I say all that in detail because I want to know, are you and Joe prepared to take on what is likely the biggest child sex scandal of human history, knowing full well what's up, what, what that would be putting you up against? Absolutely, and it, and and it's even deeper than that. I mean, we, we're dealing with and 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 I don't say this as you know some kind of black helicopter, a uh, Bohemian Grove type of conspiracy theory. It's very blatant and plain. Incredibly powerful, extremely wealthy, well heeled people who. The fact that some of them are child sex traffickers is really just an extension of who they are as people. They use their power over those who are powerless, and they enjoy it. It would make sense that uh, quite a few of them are pedophiles, too, because pedophiles are people who enjoy the sexual thrill of having power over people who are powerless and scared. So why, you know, if, if that's how you become wealthy, why would that not be how you get your, your, your kicks, too? So, I mean, it would, it would stand to reason. 
Um, but yeah, the short answer is yes. That's why we are doing this is to is to take incredibly cynical and powerful, uh, uh, well heeled political cronies out of the game and their and their craven pandering politicians who have bought and paid for them to be in office. And I know that is a mantra of mine. It is the entire problem. If you look at every single issue that we are facing, whether it's healthcare, immigration, uh, gun rights, uh, immigration, foreign policy, uh, the war on drugs, crime, safety, uh, police accountability, any subject boils down to the fact that incredibly powerful people have built a system that is built to benefit them at our direct expense. It is a zero sum game and it was designed against us. And it was designed to be against us in a subtle and insidious way that leads us to go, oh, I guess this is just my lot in life. I guess this is just how things are. You know, the cost of living goes up and uh, you know, things get tougher and tougher because we eventually just get used to it. It's the whole, you know, frog in the boiling water thing. It's designed to not cause us to rise up, not cause us uh, to get, uh, you know, too worked up. And uh, the acute harm, of course, happens to the most marginalized among us, the poor, the homeless, people of color, gender and sexual minorities, and so on, people that have the least power that even if they do rise up, no one really cares. And so that's what leads to what we have now. And so it is a systemic problem, and it is one that is addressed at the systemic level and, and by dismantling those systems of oppression. And that is what we are running on. It, it terrifies me because we're talking about people, whether you're a U.S. politician like a Clinton or you're in the British royal family as a prince, yeah. there are people like these are incredibly powerful people. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't surprise me that no one's talking about this in the media. But I, I've been looking at this and I'm saying, you know, we're so divided on how to treat coronavirus. Do you wear a mask or not? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. There are children being abducted and sexually exploited. Like the whole country should be uniting around this. There shouldn't it's be a no brainer. Yeah, it's, it's, a no, it's a no brainer. And, right. and stuff. Like, yep. These are our children. I have a four year old daughter. Stephen has a uh, eleven year old son. I twelve. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, the thought that that could happen to one of our kids. Exactly. And. And no one would even care. No one would. Well, I mean, our friends and family would right, care. Right, but the, the, but the people who body, should be taking care of it yeah, yeah. would not give a crap because it's not it's not their kid. And for all I know, they're the ones who are benefiting from that. It is a, so it is it, a frightening like thing. These... And let's be very clear, <sighs> by the way. Jeffrey Epstein did not kill himself. And I know that that's become a, a, a popular <laughs> meme -y thing. But let's like dial back past the meme and talk about the fact that an incredibly powerful billionaire who was a well-known pedophile, who literally had an island where he brought some of the most powerful people on the planet to, presumably many of them then going on to rape little girls uh, and possibly little boys as well, gets in trouble, goes to jail. We all joke about, you know, how, you know, Hillary Clinton has already wished him, you know, wished condolences on his impending suicide. And then he goes and kills himself, right? Mm -hmm. And then And then we hear... Oh, uh, there's no... He was in, a, like, a Supermax jail. But he killed himself. Camera was out. The, the guards were asleep. The camera was out. The guard uh, wasn't uh, paying attention. Like, it was so blatant. There was, like, four guards. And they all decided to take a nap. They all took a nap. And, uh, yeah, they all were... I were, believe uh, They I all believe were AWOL. And the camera didn't work. And also, he shouldn't have even had whatever it was he used to hang himself. But he did, even though it was a super max jail and they're on top of that kind of stuff. And he was on suicide watch. And like, I mean, it's like, really? And then, and the reason they can do this is because, what's, what's that? We just like have to take whatever what are you gonna do they about say it? is like, oh, well, I guess that's what, what are you going to do about it. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. are you going to do and about it? And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's because they know what, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. There's nothing we can do about it. But here's what we can do. We can vote for people who are going to dismantle these things. And that's what Joe and I are running on it. And, and I will say, we are not running primarily of kick out the pedophiles. But yes, in, in the course of doing these things, in the course of ending the wars, bringing the troops home, allowing the healing to begin, in the course of taking government out of health care and, and taking, more importantly, the cronies out of health care so it can be affordable again, taking them out of education so that that can be good and affordable again, giving people their right to defend themselves uh, and, and, and their families and their loved ones in any way they see fit and ending the ATF, getting rid of the Fed and the IRS, and removing all the barriers and burdens and occupational licensing laws and zoning laws and everything else that gets in the way of you being able to thrive and actually criminalizes the poor trying to get ahead in life. Getting rid of all of those barriers and burdens all feeds into removing these powerful people from positions of power. 
so that they can't hurt us anymore, so that they can't hurt our children anymore, so that they can't hurt anyone anymore, so that now a jerk who is out of power, a bad person without power is just a jerk. A bad person with power can ruin the lives of countless people, and we want to end that. I, cool. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. So, like, you, you talk about ending ATF, you know, any number of things. Um, how are you going to get congressional approval for that sort of thing, like for ending those? So the beauty is that we actually wouldn't need to do that. We would need to do that to make it permanent. But there's all sorts of precedent that demonstrates uh, that all members of the executive branch serve at the pleasure and discretion of the president. So when Joe comes into office, as many presidents have done before her, she can just fire entire agencies and not rehire them. And she can direct the federal law enforcement to not enforce uh, those particular laws. And then she can order the uh, them not to cooperate with uh, state law enforcement uh, in in the in the um, uh, in the the enforcing and and you know ju- uh, adjudication of of their of their uh, uh, of their state gun laws as well. Uh, and the thing is, there are going to be people going, "You can't do that. That's an abuse of power." There is. All sorts of precedents, starting as recently as Thomas Jefferson in, in the beginning of the white uh, of, of the executive branch, where they simply said, "No, we're not going to make new laws. We're simply just not going to staff these agencies and staff these cabinets." And so, uh, and what will happen is when we end the ATF, when we end the Fed, when we end the IRS, when we end the DEA, when we when we undo decades of bad uh, 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 executive orders and, and burdensome exe- executive orders when we bring the troops home because the uh, Congress didn't declare war, which means they don't have to declare an end of it. The the authorization of use of military force authorizes the president to end the wars whenever she sees fit, which she will. She'll see fit as soon as she can. Uh, and so when the American people see the immediate and profound benefits of the power being put back in their hands and the wealth being put back in their hands and the the, the freedom and decision-making ability being put back in their hands so that all of us are doing better and the harm is ending that is being imposed upon all of us. Again, especially on those most marginalized among us, but, uh, but among all of us. When the American people see that, that will give us the tidal wave of support that we can have to then go ride it all the way to Capitol Hill and say, now, We want to make this stuff permanent and we want to go even further and do things that can only be done at the legislative level. And so we are drawing a very clear line on the sand. And on our side of the line is us and those who are working with us in Congress to remove the boot from the neck of the people so that they can thrive and prosper in ways that y'all would have never allowed them to before. And on the other side of that line is those of you who are working to keep that boot on their neck and to allow continued needless suffering for no other reason than to preserve your power and wealth and influence and that of your favorite cronies. And I think we win that debate every time. Awesome. Uh, Deputy, I was going to say, I really like talking to you, Spike. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah. um, U.S. debt, it exists. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that I'm making that up. Uh, some have heard of it. Others might not know what it is, but it's a thing. It is a thing. And uh, last count, just just an hour ago, I checked on the website. Uh-huh. Last count, our debt was twenty six twenty six point six trillion dollars, yeah. and that's not talking about the unfunded liabilities. That's oh, which just is hundreds of millions, yeah. The Fed yeah. and China, yeah. So twenty six point six trillion dollars that presents some serious risks for the future of Americans if that's not stopped. So. Besides, I, I assume now, you know, we were talking about the Fed and ending it, mm-hmm. but putting the brakes on that, what's it going to take to reverse that Well, first, after you put a stop to it? Well, first of all, Joe is going to refuse to sign any bill. She will veto any bill that adds even a penny to the debt. So right off the bat, that ends. A- a- any new debt ends immediately. It withers on the vine. Also, again, I'm a libertarian. Ending the Fed also ends any debt that would be owed to the Fed. So that will take a huge wallop out of that existing debt. Um, here's the next thing. Here is the next thing. Because remember, keep in mind, a lot of that debt is owed to the Fed. The Federal Reserve printed out uh, Federal Reserve notes and then bought Treasury bonds. Even if it was, so if it was ended, that debt goes away. Who's it owed to? But that money is not... The, wouldn't it be owed to the banks that make the up banks, the Fed? The Fed itself is the one who is in charge of the of the the, the printing out of that currency, which then lends to the the the, the treasury. 
Oh, so, okay. Interesting. So then the next question comes, and this I will defer to Joe, because there are different schools of thought within the libertarian world how best to deal with existing debt once it once it is once it is uh, uh, you know, once it has stopped or even now what do we do with the debt? One school of thought, uh, which I tend to ascribe to, is that all debt that is coercively gained is illegitimate at its core. That this was debt that was incurred on the backs of people who had no uh, ability to opt out of it. And that therefore, in the same way that if I signed a loan in your name and said, you owe this mortgage and you don't get to live in the house, I live in the house, but I, I signed in your name on it. And if you don't like it, I'll put you in jail. Uh, and that, that that would be an illegitimate contract and an illegitimate debt. I would argue that all government debt is illegitimate as a result of that. Now, with that said, there are other schools of thought within the libertarian world on, you know, the, uh, I guess, the real politic of what would happen if you just canceled all the debt and so forth. So I would defer to Joe on what her official policy would be on dealing with the existing debt. But the bottom line is that when it comes to new debt, there would be no new debt because she would refuse to, she would veto any legislation and refuse to carry out the 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 spending of any uh, bills or omnibuses that resulted in a net increase in the in the debt. Would um would helping revalue the dollar after all this damage would um you say ending the Fed would eliminate that debt owed to the Fed would that also revalue the dollar or would we be looking at some sort of pro program like returning to the gold standard or something like that to make our our money worth more than it already I is? I think the government has demonstrated that uh, giving them the ability to uh, issue and 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 control currency has led to exactly what we have now just really bad outcomes by the government being in charge of deciding what money is and what it is not and what it is worth. I think that we have determined that the best way to handle that is to give it to the free market. And now what you will have is competing providers that will compete to provide you with the most sound currency. Unlike government, which has a vested interest in devaluing currency over time, because not only does it devalue the value of their debts, but it also devalues your wealth so that you are more and more reliant on them. Now your money's in the hands of people who have a vested interest in it gaining value over time so that you can compete with so that that you'll use their currency and they get a piece of it instead of their competition so it completely flips around the motive the profit motive there uh, in the hands of actually your your currency potentially gaining value over time uh or at least not losing value over time so what i'm hearing is yay crypto uh, yay crypto yay and 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 i don't and i don't necessarily want to say it has to be crypto it's whatever the market bears but yes crypto and blockchain is where the entire world is going including and in, in when it comes in currency i mean blockchain is the future of any of the major technological innovations and societal innovations that are going to happen as a result of it are going to come from blockchain uh and the trustless system in general um and and i believe cryptocurrency would would be an example of that okay <laughs> that is why they hate it. That's absolutely why they hate it. Cool. Well, I think we're probably running a little short mm -hmm. on time now. Yeah, we got a few okay, minutes. Okay. So left. let's let's. Uh, so I'm going to ask you kind of a a, a fun question. Um, not that what we have been talking about isn't fun. Uh, have you ever watched anime? And if so, what's your favorite oh, anime? Ah, uh, gosh, I have watched anime and um, Cowboy Bebop. Probably. <laughs> okay, you're gonna have a lot of people like you for that. Because and it's not because, because the main it's not because the, the main. Name. Yeah, I was gonna say it's not because the main character is named Spike. Uh, it is. Uh, I, I actually do legitimately like Cowboy Bebop, and I'm trying to think. Oh, what was that other one called? Um, Alchemist. Um, Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah, I like Full Metal Alchemist, but I didn't follow it as oh. well as I did Cowboy Bebop. Like I watched that all the way to the last episode, so I'll, I'll go ahead with Cowboy There's two versions of that. <laughs> there's two versions of that, and I will always say Brotherhood was the better version of that story. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood uh, told the story a lot better. Oh, Full of Metal Alchemist. Yeah, like I said, you already yeah. lost me because I, I don't even remember which one I was watching. But uh, Cowboy fine, Bebop, I was able to follow, and I, I did like that one. And then I got one last uh, one last question for you before we sure. get out of here. Uh, what is your t-shirt size so we can send you a the anime trainer? Oh wow, uh, uh, I'm I'm a medium. Medium, a medium. It is. cool, awesome. That's awesome. Thank you guys. Well, we'll, we'll get no, we we want to make sure that there's at least one person running for the Oval Office that actually has an anime t-shirt. Yeah, that's absolutely. very important that's awesome. to our community. Not to mention a YouTuber merch uh, shirt. I mean, look at that. That's cool. Well, we have. I our, saw that. Um, uh, I saw. Go. Sorry. Go ahead. I didn't hear what you said. 
JoJo meme thing that uh, that Joe posted. It was oh, like yeah, JoJo's the picture bizarre adventure. This right here. Yes, I don't know if that, you saw that. Yes, that. Oh. this is a work of art. Yes, it's. Fantastic. I don't know who made this. I, that was but the first thing I saw. That was the first thing I saw when uh, she was nominated by the party, and I thought, "Wait, we have a JoJo running for." No, that's it. I don't even need to read her platform. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be better than the racists and the sexists and the pedos currently running. So let's, absolutely, no, I can't. Let's... There we go. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, no. She's 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 you know people's uh, someone uh, I think it was yesterday someone said you know why should people vote for your party over others and I said because we don't suck and we aren't a bunch of uh of like sexual molesters and warmongers and murderers and they were like wow that's a very compelling argument <laughs> like, we aren't we aren't murderers you know yeah to the libertarian Welcome party to the libertarian party we aren't murderers I know that that is a, <laughs> terrible that that is the high bar here but that is the high bar here so uh, but no, thank you for having me on, and thank you for my shirt in advance. That's awesome. Yeah, I, th- I, we're we're happy to get it to you. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. And folks, if you like what you heard uh, tonight, I, I I invite you to join us at joe20.com. That's j o two zero dot com. Uh, if you're able to make a contribution, we'd greatly appreciate it. More importantly, if you can join our team, we would love it. There's a, a volunteer form you can fill out there. We'd love to have you join our team. We are building a grassroots army for human liberty that is fighting to set the world free in our time. And I believe that our time is now. And uh, and I, I thank you for your time. And I thank you for having me on the show, folks. And uh, and uh, I thank you again for my I'm really excited. I love getting merch. <laughs> free merch. No, Spike, we're so glad that you came on. It was, uh, it was an honor to have you on here. Steve, if you don't mind me signing us off. Uh, thank you, thank you all for watching this interview, this exclusive interview on the power of God and anime. And we'll be back next week with some Death Note uh, with our uh, main uh, core hosts back once again. I like thank Death you Note so much. Too. I like Death Note. Death- too. <laughs> it's the example of what happens when one guy gets too much power, like the government. <laughs> all right, guys, thank you so much for watching. watching.